to the Israel Insider weekly podcast where we talk about the news in Israel with Ron Cantor, president of Shalano TV and Israel regional director for God TV. I'm Lisa Hutchison. Thanks for joining us today. Well, Ron, uh, there in Israel, the uh, rockets continue. I believe it's day yep. 11 at the time of the recording. Give us a little update. How are things going? Well, it's been a crazy uh, 11 days. Um, and I think I probably mentioned this last week that this war literally started uh, when I landed at 6 p.m. on Monday, uh, May 10th. And um, every day has been a barrage of rockets uh, slamming into our southern cities. There was an article today in the Jerusalem Post where the mayors of the southern cities are just demanding more protection. Um, they feel that, you know, now that we have Iron Dome, that, you know, we've kind of neglected them. And I agree, you know, mm. just because we have the Iron Dome doesn't mean there aren't needs. I was just looking at a picture with Gabi Ashkenazi, our foreign minister, with the uh, UN, I think, uh, I don't know if there's a UN foreign minister, I think that's what it said, but I mean, they're in a building that has just a massive hole in it. Um, the, the, the rockets that Hamas are firing are far better than the rockets that they flew uh, are fired back in 2014. That was seven years ago. Mm -hmm. They are bigger. Their bomb load is stronger, more powerful, and they go further. Um, we've never seen this kind of barrage on Tel Aviv. So I mentioned the southern cities, but even here in Tel Aviv, uh, there was last, uh, I may, maybe it was a week ago, Wednesday, 131 rockets on Tel Aviv in the wow. Tel Aviv area. And then on Shabbat, on Saturday, I, I never did get a count, but it must have been, oh, it was well over 100. Um, wow. And a, a man was killed, his apartment was hit. The Iron Dome is amazing, but it's not perfect. It's about 90% effective. So, you know, those that di do get through, they can cause quite a bit of damage. Um, and so our mayors in the South, the citizens in the South and Ashkelon, Ashdod, and my wife, uh, she's from Ashkelon and, and the smaller cities like Sdeot, and, and we have a, a bunch of uh, kibbutzim, collective farms down there where people live. They're right on the border of Gaza and they're, they're just being smashed um, and it's terrifying. And so they're reaching out to the prime minister and saying, you, you gotta help us, you gotta do more. So um, that's kind of the news of the day. Of course, they're talking now about a ceasefire. Um, I'm not going to recount all of everything that happened last week. We've written so much. We've done so many blogs, so many updates by video. And um, this is our second podcast. So where we're at today is everyone in the world that is not part of Hamas and not <laughs> part of the Israeli government is calling for a ceasefire. Um, and uh, I just read that a Hamas uh, spokesman, official, he said that there probably will be a ceasefire tomorrow, um, that there's nothing really blocking it at this point. Israel's message is exactly the opposite, but that's part of Israeli policy. We never uh, admit that we are in negotiations for a ceasefire. We always talk strong, even Benny Gantz, who is no friend of uh, the prime minister. Uh, he is our our defense minister still, even after the elections, because we never did form a new government yet. So uh, it was kind of a weird thing when I realized today that Gabi Ashkenazi and uh, and um, Benny Gantz are still in their positions, uh, the two highest positions next to prime minister, even though the government, uh, the elections we had, in, I think it was March 23rd. Mm -hmm. That was over, well, that was two months ago. So it's just uh, been a crazy, crazy time. So Benny Gantz, he says, no, uh, we're not negotiation. We're willing to, we'll, we'll go another as long as it takes. And that's right. really the right message, I think, is um, we need to send the message to Hamas that we will protect our people and will not be manipulated. One of the things that Hamas wants, you know, they're trying to, you know, the reason you have ceasefire negotiations is to get something. And what they want to get is they want to get us out of Jerusalem or off of the Temple Mount. Now, the Temple Mount is the third hol holiest site to Islam, uh, but it's also the first holiest site to Judaism. 
you know, what I'd kind of like to say to the Muslim is like, really, did you have to pick, you know, our, we have one holy site. We have one holy site. You couldn't have picked another holy site. And look at the trouble it's caused because two of these major religions both hold the uh, Temple Mount as holy. Of course, it goes back to, you know, all the way to Abraham and God telling him to sacrifice Isaac. You know, so that that's where it happened. Mount Moriah is the Temple Mount. And then, of course, the first and second temples were built there. And then it was only uh, 600 years after the time of Yeshua, when the New Covenant era uh, commenced, that we have Islam. And there is a vague mention about Muhammad having some sort of night vision. Uh, and I am not an expert on Islam, probably never will be. Uh, and it doesn't even mention Jerusalem by name. That's mm -hmm. it, it, somehow that becomes the third. Something tells me, Lisa, if it wasn't holy to the Jews, it wouldn't be holy to Islam. <laughs> kind of makes you wonder. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's a... right now they're uh, just finishing up real quick. That they're, yeah. That's where they're at. They're talking strong, but I do expect um, this to end possibly tomorrow, maybe even tonight. Uh, they Hamas has nothing really more to prove. Their goal at the beginning of this, by the way, this the big misnomer uh, is that this is a war against Israel. This was not a war against Israel. This is a war against the PLO, Fatah, we say in, in Hebrew, Arabic. Um, the PLO, Yasser Arafat's group that he birthed back in the late 50s. Uh, they, you know, have the presidency but the legislature of the of the Palestinian Authority is still uh, run by Hamas. Now they they don't do it. It's defunct. It's a joke. Um, but Mahmoud Abbas is the president, and they were getting ready to have elections, and then he called them off at the last minute because he was going to lose big time. And so um, Hamas started this war to show the Palestinian people that they are the defenders of Jerusalem. Mahmoud Abbas he's impotent. He does nothing. You know, he sits there in Ramallah. That's what they're saying. But look at us. We're strong. We're brave. We're the guardians of Jerusalem. We bomb Jerusalem. Mahmoud Abbas would never dare do that to the Israelis. So they have come out of this thing looking like the heroes. If you're, you know, uh, in part of the Palestinian territories, whereas Israel, we uh, what we get out of this, of course, we didn't want the war to begin with. We didn't start it. Uh, but now that we're in it, we're trying to cause as much infrastructure damage to the terror machine that is Hamas mm -hmm. uh, as we can. For instance, we, uh, and this is, you know, kind of a secret, no one's admitted this in Israel, but last week we uh, lied. <laughs> I don't condone lying, but uh, they, uh, the Israeli defense uh, IDF said that that night they were going to go into Gaza and they were going to start a ground invasion. And so the Hamas leadership, commanders, fighters, they all went underground into tunnels. What they did not know is that we knew where the tunnels were and we wanted them to go into the tunnels. And then, of course, the tunnels were bombed. And uh, again, I just want to remind our listeners, we don't get excited about killing people. Mm -hmm. uh, but these were terrorists. These are people bent on murder who believe that it is their religious duty to kill Jews they don't want a two-state solution. They want a one-state solution, which is a Islamic republic on the land of Israel. Right. And that, it, it's so interesting because here in America and and probably in other, you know, democracies uh, around the world, <laughs> we just take to campaigning and uh, advertisements on TV. But to understand this conflict that's going on right now, where you are, it's uh, it's very mm -hmm. helpful to understand it in terms of the political implications as well in in that part of the world with the Palestinians and the PLO and all of that. And I also just wanted to say I've had lots of discussions lately with folks over this. And one of the things that's been really helpful is something that listeners can find on um, we posted it on the Israel Insider Facebook page. Um, the 15 facts that right. you uh, wrote. And um, that is super helpful. 15 facts to understand, to better understand the Palestinian Israeli uh, situation, the conflict. Right. And uh, so super helpful. 
I encourage everyone, if you haven't read that already, to go uh, find that on the Israel Insider Facebook page. Yeah, and it's it's free. We give that away free, and it is easy to read. You'll be able to read that in 15 minutes, and you mm-hmm. will learn more in those 15 minutes than I would say 90% of our listeners have learned in a lifetime because what we did is we put everything in bullets there's graphics it is really easy to read and it's going to equip you to answer people who do not understand the situation like john oliver for instance yeah go ahead tell us some about that he uh he sure did sound off and uh go ahead well, yeah john oliver is the english comedian used to work with john stewart on the daily show and now he's on hbo where he can be even filthier but um he uh, shared a, a brief little clip the other day about the conflict that was so misguided, so one-sided. We have a blog on our website, roncantor.com. You can go there and um, I just answer some of the, I respond to some of the things that, that he said. Um, but it, 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 this is what happens when you get in a room with a bunch of people that all believe the way you believe and you mm-hmm. never, and I've made this mistake where you, you just listen to people who agree with you and you never, and this is Hollywood. It's a big problem because they're surrounded by people who think just like they do and they never hear another opinion. And then they forget that the rest of the world may not agree with them. So John Oliver, who is this? I, I'm sure he's a very smart man. Very funny. Um, basically made a, a a bunch of comments. Again, I'm not going to go through them all for time's sake, but go to the website, roncantor.com and read the blog. I think you'll enjoy it. I think you'll find it uh, uh, informative. Uh, you know, one of the things he says is that Israel is an apartheid state. Now, apartheid is a term, uh, I believe it was created, that word in South Africa. It's not uh, a word that actually means anything, but it, go, it describes the situation in South Africa where you had a few white people, maybe 10% of the country, ruling over the 90% that were black. Mm-hmm. So it's a racist uh, system that, uh, it, you know, it's wrong. We're against it. Israel is nothing like that. Let me tell you about Israel. First of all, the majority of our citizens are Jewish. Uh, second, so we're not like just, you know, five Jews ruling over a million, uh, Arabs. Number two, when Israel became a nation in 1948, David Ben-Gurion in the declaration of independence, this is, a, this is a official document. It, it says to the Arabs who lived here, join us, become citizens, be a part of our nation. We'll build it together. 20% of Israel are Arabs, Israeli Arabs. I'm not talking about hmm. Palestinians. I'm mm-hmm. talking about Israelis, Arabs that live here, that they're part of the, you know, they, they work and, you know, mm-hmm. you can't, you, you can't avoid them. Not that, not that that didn't sound right. I don't want to <laughs> avoid them. I like, I like meeting them. I was in a hotel the other day and Mahmoud was working the front desk. Ilan and I and him, we had a great conversation to Jews and a Muslim. Uh, So, you know, the 20% of Israeli Arabs, you know, there is a racist element there, just like there's a racist element uh, on the Jewish side, just like in every country, there's a racist element. But for the most part, we get along. So that's not apartheid. You know, one of the things I would ask John Oliver is how many black Supreme Court judges were there under apartheid? Now, Mm -hmm. Lisa, I'm just going to take a guess and say zero. (laughs) And I'm pretty sure I'm right. Yeah, that'd be safe. Right. Whereas, you know, Israeli Arabs only make up 20 percent of our population. They make up one third of the Supreme Court, which is one. We have three Supreme Court justices. Justices, two are Jewish and one is Arab. And they work together. They respect each other. So, no, Israel is not an apartheid country. The situation with Palestine or rather with the Palestinian territories is that it's a difficult situation. I will give him that. But before you go on national TV and you spout off your opinion about, you know, calling Israel a racist apartheid nation, just do a little bit of homework. Because, again, first you got to separate between Israeli Arabs and Palestinian Arabs. Palestinian Mm -hmm. Arabs are Arabs that live in the West Bank in Gaza. Mm -hmm. Now, to be clear, and I'm again, I I don't want to it's very hard not to go into the whole history. Uh, They only have recently called themselves Palestinians. Uh, the, The word Palestine goes back to the Romans. 
It was nicknamed this area, region Judea. It was changed from Judea to Palestine back in 130. And so nobody claimed it as an ethnicity. And it certainly wasn't an Arab ethnicity until after Israel became a nation. Then suddenly the Arabs that were in the West Bank of the Jordan River, which was controlled by Jordan, and the Arabs that were in the uh, Gaza Strip that was under Egyptian control, they began to, you know, say, okay, we're Palestinians. As a, you know, back, back in the 1930s, anyone who lived here was a Palestinian. If you were Christian, mm -hmm. if you were British, if you were Jewish and you lived here, mm -hmm. you were Palestinian. Right. It was not an ethnicity. So the uh, 1967, Six Day War, we were about to be attacked by, by three Arab nations. We end up winning that war. Um, and suddenly we find ourselves with Gaza and we find ourselves with uh, the West Bank. And it, it, we've, been, we've been trying to figure out how to deal with that for <laughs> the last 50 plus years. Uh, we've given them a, a roughly full autonomy to a great degree. Certainly in Gaza, we left Gaza. We're out of Gaza. There's no Israeli soldier in Gaza. There's no Jewish home in Gaza. We left them. We left our homes. We left our farms. By the way, Hamas destroyed them all. Rather than learning how to farm, you know, they're, they're, mm -hmm. they're sadly, they're religious fanatics. They don't care about math and science. They just care about Islam. And mm -hmm. that's no way to build an economy. That's great if you just want to go and have religion every, you know, once a week, but you can't build an economy without math, without science, without agriculture, without technology. And you know, what's interesting, uh, Lisa, hmm. if they wanted peace with us, Israelis would be running into Gaza to help them. We would yeah, say, even... let us help you learn how to, we're going to teach you how to farm. We're going to teach right. you how to, let's build a hotel together. We, right. and we've done that. We've done that. We're doing it now with several nations through the Abraham Accords, but go back to Jordan in 1994, when we made peace with Jordan, our farmers all along the 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 border or the of the of the Jordan River on the West Bank began to help the farmers on the East Bank in Jordan. We began to mentor them. We began to help them, and and they've they have done amazing things, particularly down in the Negev Desert. So uh, again, if you want to feel hear my whole response to John Oliver, by the way, we've offered uh, ten thousand dollars to John Oliver if he will sit down with me <laughs> online and uh, and have a discussion about Israel. And yeah. the reason, and, and the, we're not going to give him 10,000. I don't think he needs it, but we would donate it to the relief effort in Gaza because not as a stunt, we, we care for those people as believers in Yeshua. We don't take delight in carnage and, and people dying. And, and we do my, my daughter, by the way, who has a real heart for them, her organization uh, has just raised 115,000 shekels. Uh, for the people in Gaza, uh, for wow. the war relief effort. Wow. Uh, the sad part is a lot of the stuff that is raised in the Arab nations and then is funneled through Hamas, it never actually goes to the people. It goes mm -hmm. to continue to build the terrorism infrastructure. So we told John Oliver, if he ever sees it, we're trying to you know make sure he sees it, um, that we will donate $10,000 to children in need in Gaza uh, if he will agree to a one-hour sit down discussion. I hope he does. It would be, it would be potentially really life changing for a whole lot of reasons, you know, for him to just have a dialogue with someone who doesn't think the way he does, that doesn't share necessarily the same opinions, though there is some common ground and just to hear it from a different perspective. And like one of the things that um, I've noticed even in these last 11 days of uh, following the war coverage, Israel is still sending in humanitarian aid to the people of Gaza. Right. Like that's amazing. So, you know, here they fully recognize, I think that, you know, there, yes, there's an enemy in Gaza, but it's not, right the regular people of God, not a 10 year old kid, even, even That's if he right. hates us, we know that he's been indoctrinated. Right. No one hurt him. In fact, right. yesterday, uh, right at the border crossing, as they were taking in, uh, aid to the people of Gaza, you would mm -hmm. think that Hamas would be happy about that, mm -hmm. but they, they bombed it. A mortar shell hit one of our soldiers. He's, he's okay. He went to the hospital. He's going to survive, 
but the, I mean, here's this, he's not fighting. He's helping. Yeah. He's trying to get food, aid, medical aid to the people of Gaza. And he gets attacked by the terrorists. Wow. Yeah. So much to, uh, to consider, uh, in all of this and to realize there, there's just a whole lot of sides to this, but to keep your compass, right. You know, by knowing, I think history, first of right. all, and then, um, just paying attention. Um, one thing in all of this uh, that has my attention and interest as well is what we were talking about a lot before the war started last week, which is politics in Israel. Right. So how, <laughs> how uh, so far, you know, we started this podcast talking about Yair Lapid, um, a centrist, which um, if I'm remembering right, basically just means he's not uh, in, in Israeli politics, just a recap for the listeners that uh, those terms of right, center and left have to do basically with two things, where you stand on national security and mm -hmm. uh, economics. And right. so Yair Lapid is a centrist and uh, he was uh, given the mandate to try to form a government. And there was a whole lot of talk about what that was going to look like, maybe even including the first um uh, Islamist Muslims uh, in the government, uh, Mahmoud Abbas. Is that his name? I think that's uh, his name. Abbas no. is his last Mansour his Abbas. Last, Mansour Abbas. Thank you. <laughs> Mansour Abbas. Um, anyway, so uh, where is that right now? He's that's the a clock's great still question. ticking. Yeah. And, and, you know, the most cynical person in the world will say that Netanyahu started this war to keep Lapid from forming a government, but no one really believes that. Um, plus, we didn't start the war. It was, uh, you know, Hamas started firing upon us. Um, things are not looking good for him at the moment, Lapid, because, uh, by the way, Lapid means torch in Hebrew. Um, his torch is, uh, it's, it's a little dim right now, but <laughs> And because right now, you know, when a, when a country's in war, you don't negotiate on forming a new government. You you consolidate, you support right. each other. And he's been very wise in that regard. He's He has not uh, sought to um, continue negotiations. Just after the war started, uh, Mansour Abbas from the Islamic party said, well, I can't, I can't be a part of this government. I can't negotiate right now. And then mm -hmm. the next day, Naftali Bennett, who's also needed for this plan to work. Uh, he said, well, I, I can't be a part of it. I, I see now that I have, I can only be part of a right wing government. Now, what does that mean in Israeli political speech? It means absolutely nothing. Um, <laughs> and, and I'll tell you what I mean by that is, and I'm surprised that I haven't heard more pundits say this. I'm, you know, they, they seem to take these people at their words, but I've been here 20 years and I can tell you that Naftali, Naftali Bennett says exactly what he's supposed to say when, because he can remember his party's called Yamina, right? You know, they're the right wing party. They're in their minds, they're they, they, they strong Israel, strong security. So, you know, in the midst of Hamas attacking, he can't be talking about joining a centrist government, even though he would be the prime minister for the first two years um, mm -hmm. as a right winger him, himself. Um, and I have a lot of respect for Naftali Bennett. I think he'd make a good prime minister. Uh, and so, and same with Mansour Abbas. He can't talk about joining it. I mean, being the first Arab to be part of an Israeli government. By the way, they would not actually be part of the government, but they would vote for the government uh, mm, to be okay. formed. So they wouldn't actually be cabinet ministers from the Islamic party, but they would make sure that it was formed. And the one thing that all of these guys have in common is that they all want Bibi to go. They feel that he's served too long, that he's become a detriment. Uh, Naftali Bennett said that if a CEO isn't doing his job right, uh, then, you know, you fire him. And I know our friends all over the world, they think, well, Bibi's great. He's on TV and he's articulate in English and he's bold. And, and, th and that's all true. I think he's been a tremendous statesman. But over the past seven years, Hamas has built up their ability to fire upon us far more than we ever imagined. Mm. And that was all under Netanyahu. He did very little to stop it. And some say that he even prefers, he prefers an enemy, uh, Hamas, than uh, the Palestinian Authority. Mm. Um, he were, in other words, he'd rather our enemy be Islamic fundamentalists, which are easy to fight against, than, you know, is, uh, you know, Arab politicians, 
you mm-hmm. know, who, who pretend that they, all they want is peace. And, and, and I've seen nothing from Mahmoud Abbas over the years or Yasser Arafat before that, that would tell me that they really want peace. Uh, they've had the opportunity over and over again, and they reject it every time. That's another thing that um, Mr. Oliver uh, forgot. But Yair Lapid, let's suppose, Lisa, that it ends tomorrow. Let's suppose there's a ceasefire and there is quiet, no more bombing. Then uh, Yair Lapid has about 10 days, I think, till June 2nd to form a government. And um, we'll see what happens. My guess is that Bennett will, uh, you know, come walk back his comments. You know, he'll say now things are over. They have settled down. You know, we've got to move on and I'll be prime minister. And same with, you know, the uh, Islamic Party. Ram that you know they have a lot to gain here the whole reason they were willing to join an Israeli government was to get stuff for the Israeli Arabs to really represent them and not just be complaining all time that's how they've been seen as complaining about the Palestinian situation and he finally said you know what that's not working let let me be part of a government or at least vote for the government and then i'm going to put some conditions which you know things like fighting or organized crime helping the economy in arab cities uh and so we'll see what happens uh, anything could happen over the next 10 days but i can say that in the media here they're acting as if he, there's no way he's not going to be able to put it together hmm. interesting okay well who knows the way things go in israel Things change so fast sometimes, you know, by this time next week, when we're recording the podcast again, it could be a whole new world. So we'll right. see. We'll see what it looks like then. Um, one thing you mentioned earlier when you were talking about John Oliver and the uh, his apartheid accusations um, in uh, the UK, there has been a lot of demonstrations during uh, these 11 days with the war. A lot of anti-Semitic sentiment being expressed. Can you yeah. uh, speak a bit about that? Yeah, just today, um, the British Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, he condemned what he called an uh, intolerable surge in anti-Semitic violence in Britain that is leaked to the conflict that's going on here in Israel. Um, a, a rabbi was attacked. Um it's, you know, there's demonstrations everywhere. I'm looking right now at a big picture that says free Palestine, resist Israeli apartheid. And of course, many of these folks are either super left wing or they are. And this is funny. They're either super left wing, which means they're pro homosexual, pro transgender, pro everything that, you know, typically religious people are against. And then they're partnering with Islamic extremists who are against all of those things. So they have found a commonality in hating Israel. Mm -hmm. Um, But Boris Johnson, he said, uh, whatever the situation is in the Middle East, there is no excuse for the importing of prejudice to the streets of our country. And um, he just talked about uh, these, uh, an assault on a rabbi, I think I mentioned a, a minute ago, and uh, there is just, uh, you know, the, the signs that are, you know, very anti-Semitic. And he is saying, uh, quote, there's no place for anti-Semitism in the United Kingdom. We just call it out and be continuously vigilant and emphatic. You know, but it is interesting. Jeremy Corbyn, who was the leader of the Labor Party for many years, um, you know, was accused over and over again of being anti-Semitic before they finally dumped him. It took them years to get rid of him. But he used to talk about, you know, quote, unquote, my friends in Hamas. Mm. So, you know, Hamas are killers. They kill Mm. their own people. They're not just at war against Israel. They're at war against anyone who does not submit to Islam. I mean, I remember reading the story of a a young kid in a uh, gas station, 16 years old, and he was picked up in an unmarked van, taken to a police, police station and beaten mercilessly to the point that he couldn't walk afterwards. What was his crime? He had hair gel on and Western style jeans. Wow. wow. So if, if those are Jeremy Corbyn's friends, I'm a little concerned for Jeremy. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, I'm really glad that the current prime minister of Britain is taking a stand against, uh, you know, this this wave of anti-Semitism that is uh, showing itself in the UK. Yeah, um, let, let me just mention this as it's coming. I'm looking at the the 
with the wire of Israeli news right now. There, as we're speaking, there's just heavy bombing going on the Gaza. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm sorry, going on from Gaza, mm-hmm. fired from Gaza at the cities in her south. Uh, but this is, yeah, on, I don't want to say that's good news, but what it typically, you, you ever seen the fireworks on the 4th of July? Right. Um, Hamas does kind of the same shtick that they do, which is you've got your fireworks and your fireworks. And after about 20 minutes, then there's the grand finale. And whenever these, right before these ceasefires happen, there's typically a massive barrage. Uh, and I will say there's something else very interesting. And that is that there have been no rockets on the Tel Aviv area since Saturday. Now, Hmm. on Monday night, they said if Israel did not get rid of, leave the Temple Mount by 8 p.m., they were going to start bombing Tel Aviv. And, of course, Israel didn't uh, acquiesce, uh, and I don't think we ever will leave the Temple Mount. It's ours. Uh, 8 p.m. came and went, and, and there was never any bombing. It was a bluff. So there, we are wondering if they even can reach Tel Aviv anymore. That mm-hmm. the, 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 it's it seems like it's t- it seems like it's time for them to stop. So this massive barrage that we've really been seeing for the past hour may be an indication that they're getting ready to sign a ceasefire. Wow. Well, I uh, I pray the people there are safe and okay, and that this is leading up to the ceasefire that would be wonderful news to for y'all to wake up to that tomorrow um uh one other thing i just wanted to touch on um it's kind of a a, <laughs> a little more lighthearted uh part of the news but uh also though has deep deep roots um there's a music competition in europe called eurovision which yes. for listeners in america it's kind of <laughs> like american idol or the voice um, maybe a little more cheesy or whatever, even than that, but it's been around a long time, 65 years. Yeah, it's also years. a little different in that it's based on countries competing against each other versus ah, okay. cons- contestants competing against each other. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, uh, with that, uh, Israel, um, sent a very special contestant to, uh, this year's competition. And maybe Ron, if you could just fill everybody in on that a little bit. Right. So Eurovision is this very cheesy uh, competition that's been going on since 1956. I did not know what it was until I moved here. And I typically don't watch it. It doesn't interest me. It's very pro-homosexual, pro-transgender. The winner a couple years ago was a transgender French fellow, um, if I'm not mistaken. And they just celebrate it. They celebrate it. Now, the one nice thing is that it can't be political. So yesterday when they asked our contest, not yesterday, a couple of days ago, when they started, the reporters asked our contestant from Israel, uh, Edin Elena, a political question, uh, the reporters were stopped because, you know, what, what she's 21 years old. You're going to ask her about war in Gaza. So good for them for, not, for keeping it a music competition. Now, Edin Elena is an inter- interesting girl because we are right now being accused of being a racist nation and she's black. She is an Ethiopian Jew and she wasn't chosen as a chosen as a PR stunt to say, Hey, look, we're not racist. There is a competition to get into Eurovision. We do have an American idol type competition in Israel um, called the next star. And she won that competition. The people of Israel voted for her and the other people in the finals were all white, by the way. And, uh, you know, Israel's just not, we're just not a racist nation. Do we have racist elements? Of course we do. There's bad apples in every single country of the world. But for the most part is we celebrate our Ethiopian Jewish community. Uh, We we celebrate uh, diversity even amongst Jewish people. Um, And we tend to, for the most part, up until, you know, this war, you know, there's been protests and, and riots, but the Jews and Arabs get along. Anyways, I digress. Uh, Ed and Elena, she's, um, you know, a beautiful young 21 year old, uh, with an amazing voice. Apparently right. she's sung, sung the highest note ever sang yeah, the in whistle Eurovision. Note. Yeah. <laughs> so we watched it the other night. I'm ashamed to say, cause it's so bad. It is so <laughs> bad. Um, you, you have to see it to understand how bad it is. And the hosts are so fake. It's just bad on every level, but we wanted to see, uh, our, you know, dear sister, uh, sing, and she did a great job. 
and she is going to the final, which probably I think it's Saturday night. Right, Saturday night. Mm -hmm. Yeah, typically is the Saturday after the the semifinals, and um, you know what what is uh, interesting about that is that you know we watch this competition, and because it's in Europe, you know we're two hours or rather an hour ahead of most of Europe. So we were up until I think it was 11.30, 11.45. And then suddenly, right as they're about to announce the, the winners of the semifinal, who would be going to the final, uh, suddenly the TV lit up with uh, bombings all over the South. Wow. Um, and the way it works, Lisa, is that when there is a bombing in a certain area, is that that city's name comes up in a bar, in an orange bar, and then there'll be there could be five bars with five different cities. The entire width or rather length of the TV uh, lit up with names of cities and they kept ch normally they stay up, you know, until the siren is over. Um, but they just kept changing and change. I mean, it was a barrage. I would have to guess it was 200 rockets. Um, and they of course, they finally, you know, they couldn't go on with the competition while, you know, a third of your country is being bombed. Um, so we only found out afterwards that Ed and Elena uh, entered the competition, comp in, uh, won rather the semifinal, one of the winners, and would go into the final. And I, I, I don't, you know, it's hard for me that, to believe that Hamas is watching Eurovision, but it does seem that they timed that to, you know, go with the announcing of the winners. So strange yeah. times that we live in, Lisa. And I just want to mention yes. something real quick. You know, I know we're, we're done. Um, you know, Messiah's Mandate, our ministry, uh, we uh, and Shilano, we've been raising funds to help build bomb shelters in uh, a city called Ashkelon in the south. Ilana and I, my wife, we have a meeting with the mayor of Ashkelon. It's one of our larger cities. Uh, on Sunday, we're going to meet with him. And we really want to help them. We want to uh, build these mobile bomb shelters so that uh, every few hundred meters or so that these will be available to one of the problems is that in the midst of these wars, uh, civilians could be walking and they're just not close enough to a bomb shelter and mm -hmm. Ashkelon, you have about 20 seconds to get, uh, to a bomb shelter or you're exposed. Wow. Wow. And so we have already raised thanks to the generosity of dear friends at open door church, pastor Tro Troy Brewer, $30,000. We're seeking to match that gift through our donors. So uh, if you'd like information on that, go to roncantor.com. We will have a slide up there. We're actually putting the form, the giving form together, but we would invite our folks, you know, folks listening to join. And here's a great way to show the love of Yeshua to the people in the weary people in the Southern mm -hmm. uh, part of Israel to show them that there are people who don't hate them. That, right. that love Israel, they're standing with Israel. So just go to roncantor.com, get that you can read all the information. There's a little video and um, it would be a real blessing if you could help at this time. Yeah, such a practical way to help. You know, prayer yes. is, is awesome. Please continue to pray. Mm -hmm. But this is a really practical way. And um, together we could really help make a very concrete, literally, <laughs> uh, difference for the people in Israel. So, well, thank you, Ron, for another uh, really interesting look at the news there in Israel. And uh, that wraps it up for this episode of the Israel Insider Podcast. If you enjoyed this weekly podcast, please be sure to give it a review on Apple, Spotify, Amazon, Google, or wherever you're listening from. Follow the Israel Insider on Facebook. And from there, be sure to sign up for our daily email to get the inside scoop on happenings in the Holy Land. Thanks again for joining us. See you next week.